All right. Hi, everyone. Happy Wednesday. Happy BIPOC Mental Health Month and welcome to today's webinar. I am because we are reclaiming African culture as a source of strength in black communities. My name is Emily Scahill. I'm the manager of public education and awareness at Mental Health America's national office and I'll be moderating today's webinar. A few notes before I introduce our presenter. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out to all registrants within one week. We don't offer CEUs, but if you would like a certificate of attendance, we have a form for you to request one. I'll post the link to that form in the chat shortly, and it will be included in the follow-up email as well. And last but not least, we've built in some time for Q&A. So please post your questions in the chat box throughout the presentation, and we'll go through some at the end. And feel free to make comments or share some of your knowledge and experiences in there as well. And now I'm so excited to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Charmaine Jackman. Dr. Jackman is a Harvard-trained licensed psychologist of Barbadian heritage. He has over 23 years of experience in the mental health field and is the founder and CEO of InnoPsych Inc., an organization on a mission to change the base of therapy and to promote wellness and healing for people of color. InnoPsych Inc. is an award-winning organization focused on increasing access to therapy through its online therapist of color directory and emotional wellness programming. For the past 10 years, Dr. Jackman has served as the Dean of Health and Wellness at Boston Arts Academy, a high school for visual and performing artists. Dr. Jackman also owns a consulting company where she supports organizations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, adolescent development, and employee wellness. We're so excited to have her with us today, and now I'll turn it over to Dr. Jackman to get us started. Oh, you're still muted. Yes. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you. This topic is especially meaningful for me um, as a Black woman, um, as a mom of two Black children. So I'm excited to share with you kind of my knowledge, both from the professional and the personal lens. Um, Thank you for that warm introduction and the opportunity to speak with Mental Health America audience again. Um, this is my second time and I had a blast the first time and hopefully this information will be as equally meaningful for folks listening in today. Um, I am, want to share a little bit about who I am. So in addition to my professional titles, um, I want to invite my ancestors into this space with me today. So. I am the daughter of Francis and Dalton. I am the granddaughter of Eureta. I am Norma. I am the mother to Sydney and Simone, the wife to Jeff, and sister to Shireen, and lots, lots, lots of people who helped me to be who I am today and who have been instrumental in my formation as a person. Um, I love talking about mental health and especially bringing people together for purpose, for the purpose of engaging in conversations that can help learn and grow and heal. And that's the work that I'm doing with InnoPsych and the programming that we do there. And this is why opportunities like this to speak with an audience around cultural values, identity, and how they connect to community, and most importantly, emotional well-being is really important to me. Um, so we've talked a little bit about some of the other work that I do at InnoPsych, and I'm happy to answer any questions and invite you to visit our website as well to learn more. Today we have um, a short time to talk about a big topic, um, but we'll be talking about identity and mental health. I'll talk about some of the African values that really inform, from my perspective, the importance and the connection to community and emotional well-being. And also we I'll be sharing some community interventions that I've been a part of, that, that I've witnessed, that I've observed, whose work I want to champion. So we're just going to get right into it. And so when we think about African culture and African people, um, we cannot ignore that the, the history of enslavement, right? That is true. And we know a lot of things that come with that. Often many things are very negative, right? The inhumane treatment the intentional eraser of our, of our culture, our names, our language, and our history um, that has contributed to historical trauma, racial trauma, generational trauma, collective trauma, you name all the traumas that are there and that we're kind of just in the last 10 to 20 years recognizing um, in the mental health field. So I wanna name that as something that's newly been recognized but has been there and has been present. 
and also the impact of enslavement and the connection to structural inequities that contribute to social determinants that impacts the functioning, the livelihood of African people today here in this country. As we know, 1619 marked the arrival of the first Africans to the United States, uh, which is interesting historically because we are now at this 401 year plus since that happened. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this part because we know it and I don't want my focus to be on the negative. I really wanna think about how we can promote and uh, foster healing in our communities. A little bit about racial trauma. Uh, again, this is not a topic that's focused on this, so this is a quick uh, overview, but the racial trauma is the impact of experiencing racialized violence, racial discrimination, whether it's at work, in your personal life, um, that leads to these social um, health outcomes that impact your livelihood. So we see often we talk about a, a shortened lifespan. So um, we know the lifespan of African Americans is much shorter when compared to white Americans. Um, the impact of racial trauma can really create a lot of self-hate and self-doubt that lead people not to sometimes aren't able to live up to their full potential. But that's also connected to some of the inequities in education, in housing that also contribute to these things. So it's really hard to think about them in isolation. Um, and then more from a mental health perspective, the impact of racial trauma is that it can often lead to hopelessness, depression, anxiety, and fear um, due to how people might perceive you, how people experience you, and how people treat you in, in, in the workplace. Walking around, you, you might hear terms like living while Black, you know, just being Black, um, comes with, um, our skin color comes with a high deal of scrutiny um, and negative perceptions about who we are and assumptions based on stereotypes. So I wanna just give that quick overview of racial trauma. The impact now of enslavement on identity, which is what we'll be talking about a little bit more today is um, there was an intentional act to dehumanize and create a subordinate um, people, group of people that was based on skin color. And that was essentially for economics, right? We know that that was to support um, a group of people who would um, harvest sugar, plant and harvest sugarcane, cotton, you know, work the fields, right? That, so that was intentional to create that subclass of people. And so the impact on our identity as a group of people, or as a group of uh, Black Americans, African Americans, um, has led to internalized oppression, where we sometimes believe those images, those negative views of ourselves, right? And that to me is that's at, at its worst, right? That impact on identity. But a loss of identity, including like a loss of our names, right? We, we've, we've had to change the names that we were given and we hope most of us, many of us hold the names of our slave owners, the people who enslaved us. Um, there was a disconnection from our culture, but also messages that our culture was bad. There were things that were evil about it. Um, there were ways that that was, that messaging was important because it allowed people to not be in community, Black people to be in community with each other, right? There was an intentional, um, intentional um, intent to um, separate, right, um, or, or put together people from different cultures because it would, it would not allow the, a particular culture to, to continue, but it also prevent people from uniting, right? If you did not speak the same language, if you had different cultural um, upbringings, then there are ways in which you, there were more um, things that were not similar. Um, the other impact on identity is we, we talked about, about a little bit also is that self-hatred. So there were messages in which we were taught our, our skin color is ugly, our facial features are not beautiful. You know, we see those messages continued again as you think you see whose, whose bodies, whose images are in magazines, right? Who are often featured in the media. 
So the, those subtle and not so subtle messages about our beauty, our intelligence, um, was really an intentional um, act, actions to dehumanize and to subordinate. And so as we talk today, there are going to be three main things that, I might, that I'm holding on to. Resistance, identity, and community. And so identity, this is a definition from Marcus Garvey, who talks about a people without the knowledge of their past, about their past history, origin, and culture is like a tree without roots. And so identity is so much a part of who we are, right? Our names, our culture, our history. And if we are disconnected from that, it's almost your loss, right? You're confused, you don't know who you are. And so that is essentially what happened to us. And you're seeing now movements about reclaiming that identity of who we were prior to arriving in the United States. Bob Marley is one of my favorite musicians. And so this is a, a, a part of the song lyrics from Redemption Song. And he talks about emancipate yourselves from mental slavery none but ourselves can free our minds. And that mental slavery is that internalized oppression. And it takes, it will take concerted, consistent efforts of unlearning history and reclaiming our identity in order to do that. So as I mentioned, I'm gonna be really focusing on resistance, reclaiming identity and building community. One quote that I really love, it's right here. It talks about until the lion learns to write, every story will glorify the hunter, right? And so you, that's an African proverb. You get the sense of, um, right, it's pretty, for me, it's pretty clear, right? So if you don't have the knowledge to tell your own story, to tell your own history, other people will write that history. And if other people are writing your stories, they're not going to get it right. They're not going to get it right. And so the idea is that we, that reclaiming of identity and reclaiming of our history means we have to challenge those narratives that we've been told about who we are, right? That we are, are, are we, we don't have a history, we don't have a culture, or that culture, there are, there are things that are bad or evil about it, right? We also have to unlearn the history that we've been told, right? So we can't trust the stories that were told about us because they were not written by us. And so how do we now recover, uh, uncover and rediscover our true history? It's also about teaching the truth about our history and our culture. And again, we build an identity and culture through that. So I'm gonna shift a little bit into talking about some of the cultural, African cultural values, but also I wanna showcase some efforts that are being intentional to help reclaim that identity and that knowledge of our history. So Sankofa, um, and my logo for InnoPsych is also the Sankofa bird. So these are two examples of the Sankofa bird. Um, and the Sankofa bird is typically featured, drawn with a bird looking back. And there's it's either a seed or an egg, if you think of the, the image on the left. There's either a seed or egg that the bird is holding on to or about to get. Um, and in my logo, in my version, I use the lavender leaf. Sankofa means go back and fetch it, fetch it. And it's really about learning from the past in order to build our future. And there's a story of Sankofa, which you can find on my website, but I'll, I'll give it really quickly. This bird, Sankofa is a bird who um, lived and uh, represented in a bird, lives in a village and reaches a certain age and leaves the village, right, to explore. And while on the exploration of self, um, encounters another bird who pretty much bullies Sankofa, tells Sankofa who she is, and really um, provides a lot of negative messages. Sankofa returns to her village dejected um, and really believe in these stories. And her community rallies and say no, reminds her of who she is, who she came from, who she belongs to. And um, in order to, remember, to remind Sankofa and other young people in that community, Sankofa is carved in wood and the idea is that they're looking back, right? So the importance of returning and understanding your history in order to build a future is so essential to 
you know, I think that that story of Sankofa is so representative of the journey of African people leaving Africa, coming to a new country and being told who we are, which is very different than who we really are. And so that Sankofa story is so telling and so appropriate in this space. I want to share, this is a, a, a door to a classroom that a teacher, um, Jovan Bradshaw in Mississippi, put on her door a couple years ago around Black History Month. And I just love the simplicity of the message, but the powerfulness of it. And I'll quickly read it. So it says, dear students, they didn't steal slaves. They stole scientists, doctors, architects, teachers, entrepreneurs, astronomers, fathers, mothers, sons, daughters, and they made them slaves, sincerely your ancestors. And so this message is a reminder to students, but also powerful for adults as well, that we were these uh, scientists, we were lots of things before we were enslaved and brought to the US, right? So it's a remembering, a reminding of who we are and who we came for. Africa is a great civilization. And if you, you actually, I'm gonna shift to, shift to the next slide. Um, Henry Gates put out this um, documentary, the six hour documentary that takes a look at uh, the history of Africa. And I encourage you to watch it if you haven't watched it before. The, the architecture, the way the food and planting, and, I mean, there's so much that went into a civilization survival for centuries. And to think that we had nothing, right, that we knew nothing, to have that lie, essentially, that we came from nothing, um, is so impactful. And so really, this is a great example of ways that we can challenge those beliefs. I'm going to start, I'm going to enter the full screen here. Challenge those beliefs of being told about who we are. Right, so encourage you to watch this. It will change your life and your thoughts about who, what Africa is. Another more recent um, documentary, docu-series, is one on Netflix called High on the Hog. It's actually written by a book by Jessica B. Harris. And this book, in the book and in the documentary, they trace the roots of African cuisine and history back to Africa. So, it's such a beautifully done documentary. I really encourage you another to watch. Um, we see the narrator go to Africa and learn about the roots of the foods that we eat today and how it, the, the ties and the threads to Africa, um, but how we were able to also make do, make beautiful foods out of things that are often thrown away, right? That we were given scraps but we were made, able to make these beautiful foods and desserts um, from what was left back. And so you, you get a sense of our creativity, our ingenuity, and our, our ability to, to take nothing and make it into something marvelous. And that holds, for me, that speaks to resistance, right? That is like, whatever you give me, I'm gonna make, I'm gonna switch it up and make it powerful, right? So I really encourage you to watch that too. So these are powerful ways in which we're seeing artists, historians really remind us and help us reclaim our knowledge about who we are as a people. Um, so wanted to shift into some of the African cultural values. Um, some of you may have heard of Kwanzaa. And so Kwanzaa is based on um, um, eight African principles. So those are really great to connect to. I'm going to tap into a few that I grew up with. Um, I might not have mentioned I'm from Barbados. And so there are ways in which, um, because we were, we were also, my people also came from Africa, were brought to the Caribbean. Barbados, actually, I recently learned, was one of the first slave societies um, by the British. Um, and so there's a lot of culture in there that often we don't talk about, but it's very present in the way that we live. Right, so many of you have heard, it takes a village to raise a child. That's a very common proverb. But the, some of the African values I wanna lift up are community and cooperation, honoring ancestors and respect for our elders, our connection to land. How we greet each other is really powerful. 
and also the idea of sharing resources and our oral storytelling. So I'll give two quick examples just to bring this to life. So, you know, I'm from Barbados and one of the things that I have seen cooperation and that sharing of resources really, really, really um, amplified is my mom, um, my mom used, was a hairdresser and she also did um, sold cosmetics around our country. But ways in which, so she got to know people in very rural areas of our country. One of the things that I saw, people were very giving of resources. So I always say, I never bought, I never paid money for a mango till I came to this country. Because in our country, if there was an excess of resources, people would bring extra for you. Like if, so I remember going home one time and this woman brought a bucket full, like those, you think those Home Depot buckets full of mangoes because she had extra and she brought it to us to share, right? And I saw many examples of people giving and sharing whenever my family cooked, right? We had parties, it was for everyone. And you knew you, you had to make extra food because people were gonna take food back home to share with their family members who weren't able to make it. So that was just that collectivity, that interconnectedness was so exemplified in my culture. The greetings I witness, um, I am part of a number of honored to be part of a number of circles with African women, women who were born and raised in Africa, different African countries. Um, and one of the things that I noticed at, at when we would have parties, when children came in and the people, the elders were sitting in a circle or sitting in the living room, whatever spaces, the tr children would go around and shake everyone's hand, look at them and say hello every person they would go around. And I had never witnessed that before. We definitely greet people in our country, but never to that level. And it was this idea of like, I see you, right? I see you, I greet you, I honor you. As my elder, I recognize you uh, and I respect you. So those are just some ways in which our, the culture's, um, way, culture is passed on and honored in our, in our communities. The other um, concept I want to talk quickly about is Ubuntu. And some of you may have heard this one. President, um, sorry, not President, Bishop Desmond Tutu talks a lot about Ubuntu and has written books about that. But it is this idea of I am because you are. I exist because of you. We exist because of each other. My humanity is intricately connected to yours. So if I do something to harm myself, it's gonna harm you and vice versa. And so it really, really speaks to community, cooperation and living in harmony. And those are again, other val a cultural value that I see in my community of women, in my, in my upbringing in Barbados, but also I see it here um, in, in African American countries as well. And the ways in which we, um, work together and build community also is reflected in our faith practices. And one of the practices I really wanna highlight because there's a lot of there are a lot of negative messages about voodoo. And my husband's Haitian and I had the pleasure of going to Haiti a few years ago for an immersion experience. And part, and part of that trip, I learned history that I had never learned about before. Um, and growing up in the Caribbean, we learned about every Caribbean island. But I held a lot of negative views about voodoo. And so I want, I'm going to own and acknowledge that because I bought into what was shared to me, what was given to me, right? We talked earlier about how our history was so maligned. We were told it was negative, it was bad. Um, and so I also believe those messages because I didn't have anything else to counter it. I didn't have, did not have anyone else tell me that's not true until I went to Haiti and learned from a historian the true value of voodoo and, and how it works, right? So voodoo is a faith practice, a spiritual practice that blends both West African and European religions. It's actually present in many countries that have been, um, that have African descendants. So in Barbados, it's called Obe. Um, in Puerto Rico, they call it Santeria. So there's ways in which it has different names, but it's essential a blending of our Western, our West African culture, uh, spiritual practices with European practices. 
And one of the things that was really, that I thought was really clever in, in the voodoo practice, voodoo was very central to the Haitian revolution. If you don't know, the Haitian revolutions when Haitian enslaved people fought and defeated the French army. And that's how Haiti became the first black republic in 1804, 1803 technically, officially in 1804. But voodoo was central to that because when people met for their faith gatherings, they were also planning and resisting. They were in community, they were reclaiming their identity, right? Their connection back to Africa in their practice, but they're also resistant. And um, one of the things that I also learned was that voodoo, in order to practice voodoo in plain sight of the masters, they often dec um, men, um, um, imitated or I would say copied some of the Catholic for example, voodoo, um, there's a lot of Catholic um, symbolism, but they masked their own voodoo symbolism with Catholic symbolism. So it looked like they were practicing Catholicism. So very clever in ways that they wanted to practice an open view, but they, it looked like they were practicing the Christian religion. So I'm gonna show a very short clip of a woman who owns, she's a mambo, which is a voodoo priestess, in New Orleans. And she talks a little bit about why voodoo was important and her connection to her culture and how she builds community. Um, let me share screen. One of the biggest misconceptions is that voodoo is evil, that we worship the devil. There's no devil or evil in voodoo. Voodoo just is. There's no black and white magic in voodoo either. <laughs> the belief that voodoo is evil and voodoo is dark comes from the fact that voodoo is black. My family and I, we are from the Dominican Republic. Voodoo, it was just always part of my family. That's the thing with voodoo. So if it's in your family and it hasn't been so far removed through generations, it'll still show up in some shape or form. Voodoo comes from West Africa. My, my lineage of voodoo is Haitian voodoo. It's a voodoo that was, that was brought from Africa to the island of Haiti and it became its own thing. Voodoo is family, voodoo is roots, voodoo is food, it's music, voodoo is prayer, it's song, dance, voodoo is worship, it's nature, it's knowing that everything around you is connected to you. In voodoo we call the priestess a mambo and the priest a wongan. So a voodoo priestess is chosen by her family to take on that prestigious role. I didn't have any plans to turn my spiritual practice into a business. It was such a private thing for me. My husband and I do spiritual consultations and the spiritual consultations are very different than any kind of reading divination that you've ever done because you're directly speaking to a spirit. The spirit comes, the spirit gets in, on the steering wheel and you and we are on the passenger seat and they're the ones who are spilling all the beans. You came here asking for a man, asking, asking about a man when your actual problem is this. And this is what you need to be focused on. But what about the man? F*** the man. This is your problem. You need to fix this or else nothing matters. Oh, when I get messages from, from clients just, just saying thank you for the work.
So I'm excited to hear what questions you will have. Definitely post your questions in the chat um, and we will continue. The other thing I want to say, um, Voodoo, before I go on is that to today, a lot of people practice Voodoo in secrecy because of the stigma around it. Um, so, you know, when I was doing my research on Haiti, 80% 80 of people identify as, as Catholic. And then people, very few people identify it at, with voodoo practice. But there are ways in which voodoo is practiced in, in um, structural ways, which people don't, don't acknowledge. Um, there's a lot of connection, she talked about, to the land, right? So in my culture, there's a lot of connection to the medicinal aspects of different leaves, right? Different plants and the healing power that they offer. Um, and so some of that information is passed down. You know, from generation to gen, I'm, I'm just amazed that 400 years later that it still persists. Um, but there are ways in which from generation to generation that gets watered down because I remember like making fun of my own mom when she would use different teas for different things. Um, but I am really embracing that and, and embracing that knowledge and want to make sure that I hold on to that. Um, all right, so um, as we talk about community, I really want to talk about, we're going to just cover um, some different aspects. So we talked a little bit about the, the power of religious and faith practices and how that's really important in bringing people together, right? And you see here, um, Blacks in America, faith and their religion is a, an essential and huge part of identity and, and how people maintain community with each other. I am part of uh, the Baptist church, Myrtle Baptist church in Newton. Um, which um, was founded from freed slaves and um, the power in that room and being away from that community for a year and a half during COVID has been really challenging because faith is about communing with each other, right? It's such a part of who we are and how we practice community and build community. I'll talk some, about some healing circles. Um, I'm going to talk first about some global movements that are also building community, resistance and identity, um, celebrations and impact of protests. Um, this quote I want to just highlight and lift up. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that again is highlighting the essentialness of community and how we are able to work together but also to build lasting change. And if we think about this next phase of our life, where this racial awake reckoning that has emerged in the wake of George Floyd's death, and we're seeing people protesting, we're seeing the younger generation really take up um, that, that, that arms to demand a different future. But we have to do it together and in unity, and we have to defy those negative messages that we learned about who we are and how we work together. So I want to talk about some of the global movements that have been really, really powerful in bringing Black people together from across the country, the world. So the year of the return, um, this was in 2019, where Ghana um, launched a campaign where he invited people from the African diaspora to come back home to Ghana. We know Ghana is one of the places, Ghana is in West Africa, and is one of the places that many slaves left. There was a door, the door of no return, and I think there's been a shift in language about that, right? The invitation to come back. And that invitation is about reclaiming identity, reclaiming history, and connect, reconnecting to roots so powerful and I think their, their tourism numbers uh, increased significantly with this campaign. And I just remember in 2019, the amount of um, social media messages and images of people going back to Ghana and other African countries to reclaim their roots and identity and how powerful that was for some people to be in a country where it was mostly black, right? Some people had never experienced that before and how powerful to see that and to see black people in all types of, of leadership roles and, and, and having agency. I think that's been a really powerful movement and I think got disrupted some by um, 
by COVID, but I know we'll see a resurgence of that in post-COVID times. I wanted to share a little bit about my own roots from Barbados. So as I mentioned earlier, um, Barbados is one of the first Caribbean islands to be enslaved um, or that brought um, African um, people to be enslaved. And a lot of the work was around sugarcane. Uh, sugarcane was a huge um, commodity and a product for Britain. And so that sugarcane industry, and even though Barbados is a very, very small island, it's like literally it takes one hour from top to from north to south, um, it's 144 square miles, but was essential to the British economy at that time because of the ability to use African people to work the land. But one of what you see here on the right is called our Kadumut Festival or Cropover Festival. And this is usually the Kadumut Festival is, happens the first Monday in August. And it is a celebration. It started as a celebration to, to signify the end of the harvest. Um, you know, harvest time, the, 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 the sugarcane season, long and hard. Barbados is a hot country. And so imagine being out in the fields, using a cutlass, so we call a machete, to cut sugarcane, so people are often injured, hurt, um, mosquito, I mean, like, just the conditions were, 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 were severe. And so when the season was done, there was a celebration of that hard work being over, and people celebrate. And so we also see um, there's so much joy, right? And so in spite of very challenging and difficult situations, we've all, often always been able to find joy in those situations. And so I think the Crop Over Festival is a really good example of that. Um, Carnival has become another global movement for, for tourism and bringing people of the African diaspora back to the Caribbean, right? So you see, I know Trinidad and Tobago is also they they probably you know I'll admit they kind of rival us with the, with with our with their carnival. Um, theirs is much bigger than ours, but um, lots of people have been going to Trinidad and Tobago. There is this usually same time in uh, New Orleans around um, at, um, Lent season. Ours is at a different time of the year. I think we're the only country that's in that time of the year, which is in August and around this time. Um, and so, but there's people who have, you know, from Barbadian history, they go home, like that's the time they look forward to going home, that celebration and being in community with people has been really part of our identity as well. Another global movement is Black Panther. And I know it sounds, it may sound strange to some people, but Black Panther as a movement, as a movie, kind of spawned this global movement, right? Of people celebrating their African, history and we saw in fashion by like even me right like that ability to reclaim that our identity and our fabric um, and seeing that as beautiful and nor, no longer seeing that as something that people who are less than might wear right that honoring that the royalty in, in that the hairstyles that came from that it was a social movement but it also celebrated a primarily black cast and the director was black, right? So this celebration of our intelli intelligence, but also seeing our skill as creators and artists. Um, but it also did successfully and it showed the power of the black dollar, right? Black Panther is still one of the top 10 movies in the box for the box office and one of Marvel's top five, right? So we could see the buying power of black people when they are moved. I think there's always been a narrative about Black people won't, don't support movies. When we're motivated, we do, right? And so that when we can celebrate our culture in such a positive way, that movie, and even from, again, personally, my son loved this movie, right? And he was excited to go, he put on his Black Panther costume to go. People dressed in African attire, it was almost like they were going home to Africa when they went to watch this movie. So this is just promoted, again, this global movement, and then I think also then spurred on the year of the return, right? Because this was in 2018. I'm ha you guys are seeing, I have a lot of joy around this because it really warms my heart. It brings a lot of joy to me to see my people, but also to see me, I am reclaiming my identity as well. 
Um, and I, I also want to talk about reclaiming wisdom. I'm going to wrap up soon because I want to make sure we get time to answer some questions. But again, seeing all this movement about reclaiming identity, we're seeing people actually step into their power and their knowledge. So I have, these are, what you see around here are products that some of my friends have created. I have a friend, Tato Mwasa, who is from Botswana. Um, she created this um, Sawa African trivia card game. There are six categories and it has African culture, business, um, trivia facts, right? And it's all about providing an opportunity to gain knowledge about African culture and history and about African people and the contributions that we have made the peace the Nobel Peace Prize awards that we've we've earned right so having the, that knowledge is really important she also wrote this book 14 African women who made history right so she is also lifting up the importance of women um, for our girls right the importance of women in the in, in in our history that we don't learn about so we're seeing more resources supporting African identity more books written by black authors more representation in film and arts, more businesses. We're seeing an explosion of black owned businesses in this year, sorry, in 2000, 2020, but also black women owned businesses. Another friend of mine started a company called Kidogo Productions and her idea is to make films that highlight um, black children, their talents, their culture, their voices. Cause we don't see a lot of that, right? You have to, I have to look really hard to find books and videos that highlight black children in everyday life not having to be extraordinary and and those are narr narratives that we often see in in books and films like there are these children or these people that have done extraordinary things i just want to see black kids being black kids right they need to see that and then the my time to thrive these are card decks that i created to promote emotional healing for my people so we see that people are tapping into their creativity their knowledge and wanted to contribute to our, the upliftment of our people. I'm just gonna talk about three organizations which I really love and then we can open up for questions. So the Community Healing Network is an organization I just became familiar with in the last year. Their mission is to mobilize black people across the African diaspora to heal from the trauma caused by centuries of anti-black racism, to free ourselves of toxic stereotypes and to reclaim our dignity and humanity as people of the African ancestry. They run Ubuntu healing circles, which are led by non-clinicians, which I love because we have this idea that only people who are licensed mental health professionals can do clinical work or could do healing work. And it's challenging that narrative. Um, they do these emotion eman emancipation circles, which are powerful. I'm currently in one, it's a four week intensive and it's been marvelous for my own sense of growth as a person, connecting back to my culture, my history, and my identity. Uh, they also have a podcast called Breathe Baby Breathe podcast, where they highlight, they really break down some of the cultural values that I mentioned earlier. They're talking to scholars, um, people who from both African descent, African diaspora, who study these concepts, live these concepts. So I encourage you to check out their work, um, very powerful work. And you can also, they also have a YouTube page where they also highlight and interview people who are in the community doing work to heal and grow. The other organization I wanna highlight is the Association of Black Psychologists. And you don't have to be a psychologist to be a member. And their, their goal, their mission is about the liberation of the African mind, empowerment of the African character, and enlivenment and illumination of the African spirit. Again, these are all these organizations about black liberation, healing, and really affirming who we are, reclaiming our identity. They also do these Salabono circles. Salabono means I see you, right? That we talk about those greetings where people go around and you see each other. But these are creating spaces, healing spaces for us to reconnect, um, to build community, um, to connect to our traditions and to empower us to free ourselves from mental slavery as um, Bob Marley has urged us to do. Um, they also have a certificate in African Black Psychology. So organizations out there that are doing very powerful work. Acoma, the Acoma Project is another organization that's focused on teens and adolescents. 
And they're also doing work to create spaces for youth of color to live un unapologetically, authentically within an environment that allows them to rise and thrive. Their work is backed by research. The, the founder is Dr. Alvi Berlin Noble, who is a psychologist, and she does a lot of research on adolescents and mental health, um, Black adolescents and mental health, and she also offers free therapy resources. So the impact of community on identity, I hope you've seen, right? That I have these takeaways, but I hope that you've seen it, right? It's about self-love, it's about unity, it's about belonging, empowerment. And I added this word because I wanted to just be a little cheeky, unstoppableness, right? When we can reclaim our identity, when we, we can resist the lies, we are unstoppable. And we've seen that through our artistry, our knowledge, all the works that I share today are about people challenging the lies that we've been told about who we are and on a journey and a mission to change those narratives about who we are, to, to reconnect with our identity and our culture and our history so that we can live in our power and we can be unstoppable. I see you. So this is how you can connect to me. Feel free to take a quick screenshot. Um, I am a psychologist. I do a lot of work on DI consulting, diversity, equity, inclusion, wellness workshops. Um, you can connect me through email and follow me on Facebook. I run a program called Thriving Thursdays where I interview people of color, mental health advocates, and, and professionals who are doing amazing healing work in the community. And we have all of those are recorded on our YouTube page. So I encourage you to check us out. And as we open up for question and answers, I really want, I'm gonna ask you to think about two things. Um, so I know you have, may have questions and comments for me, but I want you to think about what are the initiatives that are happening in your community? So you, I want you to do research and think about what those organizations are, what are they doing, and how can you uplift and elevate their work? How are you supporting black businesses um, and black organizations? So. If you're a Black person, how are you connecting and understanding ways that you can elevate that work? If you're a white person, how can you support through donations, spreading the word about the organization and the, and the great work that they're doing? Thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And like I mentioned, we do have some time for Q&A. We've already got a bunch of questions um, and a bunch on identity. So what advice do you have for people of color and specifically black people for how to maintain their identity and esteem and dignity while consistently being bombarded with microaggressions or unconscious bias um, in workplaces or in everyday life? And then another question on identity, are there any types of evidence-based treatment um, or approaches that have been designed to address these identity struggles? So the first question is, so how do you maintain that? And I think it is, it is really challenging, right? Um, how do you maintain this sense of who I am, this positive sense? It is challenging, but I encourage people to be in community, right? This whole talk is about strength in communities. And so when you're in communities with people who elevate, who affirm you, who nurture you, um, that will be there. But it is an ongoing, it's, for me, it's like it's ongoing work, right? So I am constantly putting myself in places where I can learn and grow, right? Doing this in emotional emancipation circle, these EEC circles. Help me to think about my identity and what I want to do, how it, as a parent also, how am I making sure that I am providing the messages that will help my children to feel affirmed in the different spaces that they're in? Um, so I think it's constantly about community. Who are you with? What are you reading? What are you exposing yourself to? So if you are in places where you're in predominantly white institutions and there are a lot of negative messages, making sure that you are creating space for you to reconnect with that history. Great. Um, so when trying to learn and reclaim the narrative about Black culture and history, we're seeing a lot of progress with redesigning textbooks and curriculum, but we're also seeing a lot of white fragility and defensiveness, especially with all the pushback against critical race theory lately. So how do you work through that white fragility and defensiveness on trying to get an accurate teaching of history of Black folks? Yeah, I love that question. And 
you know, you think about the rationale, right? So if, if people are honest about the history, then there's an accountability that comes with that. And people aren't ready to be accountable. Um, I think we have, you know, there's critical race theory. And there are people who've been doing this work. You know, you don't have to call it critical, critical race theory, right? You can call it other things. Um, you know, I think it's about, you know, again, I'm going to keep using the word community, right? So um, hopefully you don't get tired of it. But it's about, okay, so if you are, if you're in a community in, in, a, in a district or in a town where you want to see work, I, I like the work, um, and I'll raise her name, um, Zaretta Hammond, she does um, culturally responsive teaching, right? That might, that is actually, for me, that's great because it helps really give teachers and, and um, districts, school districts, strategies on how to make sure that their curriculum is bringing in the different cultures of the kids that they face. So we can fight about critical race theory, but I also know that there is pedagogy, like critical um, cultural responsive teaching that actually helps teachers build more inclusive and equitable spaces. But if you're in that space, I mean, I think it's about, you know, again, that quote, right? Go, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So who can you help you on that journey, right? And I, you know, I love that I'm seeing more, more women and more people of color get into politics because the more that we're in those places, those decision-making places, then we can have more of an impact. But I would say, don't, don't stop the fight, right? But find your allies, right? Because we can't only do this work with people of color or Black people. We have to find white allies who can do this work and speak up in spaces where we can. Um, so, and that is about building community as well. Great advice. Um, there's a lot of skepticism surrounding use of traditional and spiritual healing practices since they aren't rooted in evidence-based concepts. So how would you encourage the integration of traditional and spiritual into other knowledge? Yeah, I, you know, again, I, again, we are often skeptical, skeptical about things we haven't, you know, we don't know about, right? So we may hear a little thing here or there. And so we make assumptions or we, we believe narratives. Again, I grew up for most of my adult life having very negative messages about we do until I went to the country until I, you know, heard the history and heard the impact and really listened to how people practice. Um, I've never um, gone to a voodoo ceremony. That's still something I want to do with respect, but it's also about being in places, right? So, you know, we often, it's very easy to judge something we don't know. And, you know, we really can't be in that place. So I think it's about if there's a way to incorporate. And again, one of the things that we talk about is like, um, and it's not my quote, but like we, um, we can only be free when we're all free. So if we're excluding people because of their religious beliefs, that means it's going to limit our, our ability to proceed and move forward, right? Again, um, that whole I am because we are, like our humanity is connected with each other. So if we exclude other people, our progress is going to be limited and, and impacted. Great. Um, could you name some children's books or books for youth um, that could be beneficial on this topic, on Black identity, um, and especially some interest in books for white families who have adopted Black children? Yes, yeah, so um, there are lots of books out there. <laughs> um, I, sh I should have included a slide. Um, there is one by Lupita, um, I can never say her name correctly, um, it's called Solway, S-U-L-W-E. Um, Stamped, um, there's one for kids, written by um, Jason Reynolds and um, Ibram Kendi. And, you know, the other thing that I would say is like, yes, you can read these books are intentional, but I think it's really important when I say to families who are looking for stories, it's really important when to, to use books as a way to talk about culture and a way to expose your child to different cultures. It's something that I, I did and I've done and continue to do in raising my own children. Um, so I invite you to look at your bookshelf, right? Who are the characters who are being featured? 
are they all white characters, then you need to do a cleanse. You need to kind of make sure you're building back in. And so it's about cultures, not just about black children, but we read, we read books about um, children who are, are Muslim. We read books about children who are disabled. We read books about, about, about all kinds of children. And I think that's the idea of having that inclusivity and that learning about other people and a curiosity about other cultures, I think is really important. But not only those exceptional, right? Like for me, it's really important when I'm looking for stories in books, I don't want the exceptional characters, the characters who rose above and had to do all. I'm really important in narratives that show my children, black children just being black children, playing and having fun and in school, like, right? Like living their lives. Like they don't have to be exceptional. And I think there's this narrative is that we can only be exceptional or those stories are only valid. I am more interested in seeing my kids see experiences of kids in every day, right? Because I don't want to have that narrative of that struggle narrative, right? No, I want them to have a, a, a read stories that represent them in many forms. Fantastic point. All right, we've got time for one more question. Um, how can people connect with some organizations that focus on these traditional and spiritual methods? Yeah, so I'm, you know, I was very intentional of naming three organizations, Community Healing Network, the Association of Black um, Psychologists, Oklahoma Project, but there are lots of organizations there. So I really, you know, my question to you all was to like, I, your goal after today's topic is to look in your communities and see what's out there right really research that and it may be asking some questions like you know what are the organizations who are doing healing what are organizations that are focused on black identity because i guarantee you if you're in a black community or near a black community there are people doing that work right and i think there is this narrative as well is that black communities need help and savior from you know white white people to come in and tell us what to do but if you look if you look there are people already doing the work. And so that's, that was why my question is to like, I encourage you to look in your community and see what's already there. Wonderful. All right, and we'll wrap there. Thank you so much, Dr. Jackman, for sharing this valuable information with us today. It looks like people were so engaged in the chat box there. It looks like people got a lot out of this. So really happy everyone could join us. We'll be in touch with everyone in the next few days with the recording and a link that link to request your certificate of attendance. But other than that, we're good for today. Thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your afternoon and week. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here.